Welcome to another episode of Power Outfits. I'm one of your co-hosts, as always, Sabi Piscatelli, and I got my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful fiance with me, Amanda Sacramento. How you doing, baby? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Weather's beautiful down here. Uh, can't complain. Yes. You know, it's 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 like that teetering where like it's still kind of nice, but you could tell that heat's coming, man. Yeah. So it's a little bit, you know, but it's been it's beautiful. Been nice for sure. We're excited. We have another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. We've been uh, getting some good traction, which uh, it's, been, yeah. it's been good. Some of your, your videos going viral about, you know, fans buying you gifts, I see. <laughs> yep, <laughs> everyone's I love got, it. Everyone's got something to say about that, but it's all good. I like yeah. it. Um, but awesome. You know what? I'm excited about this guest today because before I introduce him and talk about his accolades, you know, I think this guest really fits our podcast and what we do and what we talk about because as you guys will see, as I introduce him a little bit, this man has been successful on pretty much everything he's done. Um, and he's been successful at different levels, uh, which to me, you know, indicates uh, and represents his work ethic, how he grew up, what his mentality is in life. And I think that's what this podcast is all about, learning from people who um, develop such a good routine. They develop the mindset to be successful in any avenue. You know, they take failures and they take success and they grow from both of them. So um, before I introduce, I just want to throw, you know, a couple of his accolades out there. Uh, this man was a absolute stud at Maryland. He played defensive tackle. He broke a lot of records um, in the weight room. Uh, bench press. He actually ran a 4-7 40-yard dash. That's pretty impressive wow. as a D lineman. Um, not only that, he was extremely successful in WWE. Um, but before that, he actually played in NFL for years, which, again, incredible accomplishment. Um, so this man has been successful in the college, in the professionals, and in WWE. So it's, a, it's actually a privilege to have this man on the show. Um, without further ado, Mojo. What's up, my brother? Hey, Mojo. what's up, my friend? <laughs> How we doing? Good. How are you? We're so happy to have you on here. Thanks for joining us. No, thanks for letting me come on. The show has been absolutely blowing up. I'm seeing uh, clips go viral on my Discover page. <laughs> so, uh, yes. This is good for me, guys. This is good for me. No, we love awesome, to see man. it. No, we're excited. I love how you're representing Maryland behind you. I got I got the Oregon State behind me. I like okay, that. We, we keep right. it true. We keep it true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, uh, we got to play y'all in that Emerald Bowl game. Oh. Is, uh, out so well for us but it was a fun one nonetheless i forgot about that i was gone already but you were there right that was your senior year uh that was my junior year junior i had one year. more after that okay yeah yeah i was wow. gone already what year you graduate college i forgot i was 08 so I okay was year after that. so i was 07 draft so yeah technically i was 06 yeah okay all right awesome man. yeah that was the year right after you then. yeah yep. absolutely man well listen man thank you for taking your time to come on the show we're excited to have you man we're excited to to have these people hear your story. I can't wait to dive into all this. Um, and, you know, for me personally, like I said, when I was introducing you, you know, I admire that uh, when I look at your resume, you know, it, it's so impressive because not only did you become very successful, obviously you were probably very successful in high school to get to a, a college like Maryland. You were obviously very successful in Maryland. Um, you got the opportunity to play in NFL, which is a tremendous accomplishment. And after that, you excelled in a whole nother profession. So before we kind of get into all that, I want you to just kind of talk a little bit about your upbringing, Talk about your mindset, how you develop such great work ethic, and you know, did your parents have a big role? Just kind of start from the beginning from these people so they can know a little more about you. Yeah, I like that question. Nobody really takes it back to uh, yeah. the childhood from the from the come up, you know? Um, hey, I grew up in Alexandria, Virginia. I went to the high school from the movie Remember the Titans, uh, T.C. Williams. So oh, wow. um, had, had an awesome upbringing, man. You know, as a kid, was was very loud, obnoxious all over the place. <laughs> always, I uh, could see that. <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> That's the tone for the rest of life. But, uh, you know, it, it started with the parents, right? And, you know, I had two good parents that were, you know, really, uh, I mean, they were hard on us, not like, um, you know, they were tough tough parents to live in their house or anything, but they were very regimented and they had high expectations for us. And, you know, I always like to credit with uh, my dad for my work ethic. You know, he was just a guy that was nonstop, you know, the OG of stay hyped. I like to say, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know, he started a business was always working with the business. The second he came home, he was, he was all about us. He was taking us to all of our practices and, you know, soccer was the family sport when I was growing up, he mm. was a big soccer player. So, 
it was taking us over to the field and just nonstop running and conditioning and having fun. He always did it in a way that it was really fun. And, um, you know, that kind of set the tone for work ethic from the start. And on the flip side of that token, um, you know, it was it was my mom that was, you know, helping us out with school and throwing us in front of the computer and helping us with our papers and making us understand the topics, not just getting through the uh, homework assignments, but truly understanding them, which was like pulling hair at the time. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was probably the reason we had such an academic focus um, in the house. But my mom was a guidance counselor at the school system, um, you know, when I was coming up. So being able to read people, being able to understand people, empathize with people. I mean, that was uh, that was things I got from my mom. So you put those two together and uh, it really was the foundation we needed for success later in life. Man, that's awesome, that's awesome, man. You know, when I hear that, same thing with my dad, we've talked about this before, like, you know, I, I look back now and it's like, you don't really realize at the time how much your parents sacrifice. Um, literally, I mean, my dad used to work all day, come home, have his pasta, and then go to practice all night with me, every single night, all different sports. So when you start to look back on that, you're like, wow, our parents gave up a lot for us to be successful. So that's awesome to hear that story, man. I really like to hear that, man, that your dad and your parents just really dedicated themselves to be such tremendous parents and make you grow into the individual you become, man. It's awesome to hear that. Yeah, man, they were they were awesome. Still have that relationship with them now. They're, uh, they're always still on me about whatever, but uh, that, that's what you need, right? You need Absolutely. somebody to uh, keep you in check no matter how well life treats you. Definitely. So, so tell us a little bit, obviously, you know, you go to college and, um, did you always, when did you start playing football? Like what was your, when did you start originally? I started in the high school. Oh. Um, my mom didn't want me to play. She thought I was going to get hurt, which was kind of funny because at least in, in my school, in my grade or whatever, I was like the biggest kid in class. So I was like, I don't know. I think I'll be okay. All these guys are smaller than me, but <laughs> hey, it doesn't matter how big you are in football. Somebody will take you out. So right. had to um, wait till high school. I actually tried out for the city team. I believe it was in seventh grade. I had to like drop 15 pounds or 20 pounds, whatever to do so. Uh, because at that point it wasn't by age. It was like by weight class or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With my age, I only qualified for this one weight class. I remember I was like eating lean cuisines and I was running <laughs> at the school with garbage bags <laughs> on. And I finally lost the weight and then not enough kids showed up for the team. So they they canceled the team and then I had to wait another year till high school. But it's all oh. good. I was heartbroken oh. then, but it's okay. So no. you I, you guys both started uh, football. Yeah, in, late. I mean, it, later, you would say, right? Yeah, but see, I, I, mean, think, I think what he talked about was he said something about soccer. Yeah. You know, I think you playing other sports – you know, molded you to be a great football player, obviously, because you, you developed, you know, the body control, the work ethic, the skills of your yep. feet. So obviously you were an athlete your whole life. So your transition to football was kind of smooth, obviously. Yeah. You know, um, from a conditioning standpoint, playing soccer and basketball, I mean, I had the cardio element of it. Uh, it did take me a little bit to to kind of like unlock the hit stick, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, uh, that's everyone. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, you, you, I'm allowed to tee off and and really try and take out my buddies. Like I can hit this guy as hard as I, I possibly can. <laughs> it takes you a little bit to get in that, that mindset. I think my first season of playing, I didn't quite have it. I definitely had it uh, by year two, but... Yeah, it is an interesting concept. You're you're essentially armed with weapons, a, a helmet, yeah. shoulder pads, and you can just go tee off on your buddies. It takes you a little bit to get there. Um, that's awesome. Tell me a little bit about uh, your mindset. Obviously, you went to a great college. Maryland's tremendous. Um, obviously, you were a great high school football player. Was your dreams to be a great college football player and play in the NFL? What was your mentality at that point in your life? I want to know about that. Yeah, so when I was a young kid, I, the first thing I ever wanted to do was be a pro wrestler. That's what I was watching. That's really? what I was most passionate about. Yeah, Ooh, from the start, like wow. watching with my dad and my brother every single week. But that that dream was kind of put on hold for a bit because you can't sign up for pro wrestling in, in grade school, you know? So yeah. you start playing other schools. You learn to love other things. And for me, yeah, that became football. So I went all in on football. The more... 
I got in on football, the less I was watching wrestling or, or anything else to that extent, you know, because you're all in on, on what you do. So when I started playing football, I loved it. I knew it was a great fit for me. I felt like I had the size and the tools to to back it up and, and things were going well. So um, I didn't start at Maryland. I actually went to a small division three school for, for two years. Mm -hmm. I just nobody recruited us at our school. We were terrible. We we're the worst team <laughs> in the state. We won four games in four years. I played for four different head coaches during that That's time. That's rough, so yeah. Yeah. Playing TC at the time was kind of a joke. It was like a, a gimme win. And that's when the movie Remember the Titans came out. Yep. Wow. So we played in every single team's homecoming. Every team wanted oh. to kick the crap out of the school from oh, the movie. Oh, shit. Yeah. And they did. 69 0, 72 0, 75 0. Oh, my gosh. Oh, People were quitting left and right in the middle of games. It was off. I think we scored. 14 points the entire season. It was wow. Brutal. Wow. So yeah, no, no college coaches wanted anything to do with us. So I had to go to a small school first, but you know, that went really well. I wanted to challenge myself, move up. I didn't want to play division three ball. I thought I could do more. So gave up my academic scholarship there, walked on at Maryland and uh, yeah, man, had the, had the hard climb up from there, but it worked out. That's even end. more impressive, though. If people yeah. listen to this, man. That people don't understand. Like, yo, you didn't, you didn't have that full scholarship out of college, man. You kind of had a, a different path, and you didn't give up. So I think that's a great message. Where like, you're all right. You know what you wanted to be. You got there. You played for Maryland. You played in a bowl game, and you got a shot in the NFL. So that's even to me. That's more impressive, man. It really is. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I'm for I'm forever grateful for it too. You know, because it was college was tough, man. My first football camp was the most difficult thing I've ever done. Probably the the hardest I've ever had it, you know, from a, from a sports perspective. Uh, but, you know, just teaches you that drive, that commitment, that perseverance, you know, cause the scholarship players, they get to have meals in, in the dining hall. We, we weren't allowed to as walk-ons wow. like the, wow. the, the scholarship kids are getting their bowl gifts and they're getting extra sets of cleats and, and clothing and, and all of this stuff, we didn't we didn't get any of that as walk on. So we still had to go to practice. We still had to do all this. We had all the same commitments that the players had, but we just didn't get any of the perks with it either. And we had to find a way to pay for school. And when I was out of state, that was like 30, 35 K a year. So when you're when you're combining all these things and they don't want you to make the team like no, no program wants the walk on to get the job over the scholarship guy, as you know, because that coach vouched for that player. They put their name on him, yep. you know, like Great if you've point. got a walk on that comes in off the street and, and takes the spot of a scholarship player that you vouch for, that you took the school's funds and resources and gave to that guy, that doesn't make anybody look good. Great point, so, man. You know, wow, the come up as a walk on yeah. is brutal. So they don't want you to have that job. You have to do everything you can to take it from them. And, uh, you know, it was a short term hit. I mean, I think when I, when I left, I had like 150 K in student debt between my bachelor's and my master's, but I would pay that any day of the week for the life lessons learned from it, man. It, it really, really set the tone for, for things later in life. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, I, that's unbelievable. And I think that is an indication of what instill this work ethic in you because I want to jump into it as we go on but before we get too far ahead talk a little bit obviously you worked so hard you became a walk-on you got a position you got a shot in the NFL the ultimate ultimate dream of any NFL any football player you reach the pinnacle I don't care if it's for one day one hour one year one play one OTA it's an unbelievable privilege to, to step on a football field so talk a little bit about that aspect of your life yeah man um so let's see I you went through my numbers. I, I had a pretty good senior season. Um, the combine, like the pro days, I knew with those numbers, those were going to triple my stock because I worked really hard in the weight room. And that was kind of part of the thing of trying to make the team at Maryland. It's I can't just be good on the field. I got to have the highest GPA on the team every year, which I did. And then like, I got to break all the weight room records and I have to have every single aspect of being a college player top notch at a competitive level in order to get the job that anybody else might have just been gift wrapped. So I, I had all these things right before my pro day when I was about to really up my stock. I pulled my hamstring training too hard, which 
Damn. Training too hard was kind of my <laughs> MO for a long time there. I really needed to smarten up later on, but uh, I got to Green Bay on a tryout basis. You know, I didn't get drafted. I didn't get signed after the draft. I was a little bit bummed out about that. I felt like I had earned at least a, a guaranteed shot somewhere. Didn't get it. So Green Bay calls. They said, we want to bring you in for a mini camp with the team. There's going to be, I, I don't know, it was like 30 or 40 players trying out and we'll see who who makes the team. And for me, you know, that was just, they might as well have told me I already I had already made it because in my mind, it was like, I, I am the, you know, I am the walk on. Like, this is what I do. I'm never yeah. been underdog. I've always been that tryout guy. Yep. So I went in there, left it all out in the line. I'm screaming. I'm, I'm you know, kind of mojo <laughs> out there. I'm running. I'm making plays. Yes, sir. No, sir. Respectful. And uh, I ended up making the team and, wow. you know, they called me into an office and they, they told me I had made it. But, um, you know, I flew home afterwards and my dad picked me up at, at the airport and we had this really cool moment. And I think telling him that I made the Packers, that was probably the best moment Aww. of my life, I think, thinking wow. back on it. Like, wow. uh, not to compare football to wrestling, uh, but even all my moments in wrestling, I think that's still number one to me, being able to tell them I made the team. Because that right there, that that jump starts your life. You, you know, just having a shot on the team, putting on the pads for one day, like that's a that's a notch on the resume. That's something that's going to help you out in the future. So I knew I had it unlocked like this next level of life. And uh, yeah, man, I tried to make the most of my opportunity had an injury and that was that for football. But yeah, that was a, that was a really cool thing. I wow. mean, Sav, you know how it is. I mean, you, you were drafted, bro. You went and you killed it. You had all time records at the combine, which <laughs> I, used to, I used to talk about this in WWE and nobody ever understood it, but you had the all time record for the three cone drift. short shuttle. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Short so that, that's, that's better than a 40 in my opinion, because yep. When the hell are you going to run 40 yards straight on a field unless you're it's a true. wide receiver? It's, it's funny. Know? It's funny you say that. Uh, when I when I broke that record, I had a GM come up to me. He goes, listen, he goes, listen, son. He goes, I care more about the short shuttle for a DB than the 40. And he goes, you just breaking that record just show. And I I still ran a fast 40. I ran a 4-4, you know, high 4-3, 4-4. But that's a good point. But I wanted to pause you for a second because I want to I want to I want to have these viewers hear this, man. Um, I wanted to say off some of your records right now that you broke in the weight room. I mean, you did the bench press 36 times, bro. That's unbelievable. Wow. So I hope people realize that is like ridiculous strength. He ran a 40 on four four seven eight. I don't think people realize how fast a four seven is for a D tackle. Just in general, four seven's fast. Uh, his power clean was 390 defensive line record. The man jumped 36.5 vertical jump. And I'll tell you something, Mojo. We just talked about the record I broke. Your short shuttle was 4.3. Let me just throw this out there. I know DBs who started in the NFL that ran 4.3 shuttles. Okay, Just so you know, I don't think people realize how fast a 4.3 short shuttle is. That just shows how athletic you are, how explosive you are, and how hard you work, man. So I just wanted to kind of put you over real quick so people know, listen to this, that, you know, I think what's impressive from your story that I didn't really realize until you're talking about it is like, not only have you been like the underdog your whole life, like the guy that didn't have really have a chance to make it, it's almost more impressive to me when a guy like you makes a team because like you just said, you know, they throw everything against you to not make that team. You know, because like you said, you're making it, you're making the scouts look bad, you're making the coach look bad. I gave a guy a scholarship and you beat him out. So all those people, it's like an ego thing for them, right? They're like, oh, I can't look bad. I can't be wrong. But all those people were wrong. So, you know, man, kudos to you about that. And uh, I'm impressed, man. I'm impressed with that. And I love how, obviously, out of everything, like the most positive, um, you know, moment that you take from that is like the time that you remember telling your dad. You know what I mean? Like that's such a proud moment. Like when your dad picked you up from the airport, like that's one of those things where like, you know, so many things we do still to this day, it's like we're always trying to make our parents proud, right? Or our families proud. And it's like, I still try to do things where I'm like, you know, and I see like the smile on my dad's face or whatever it may be. Um, and you know, we can relate with wrestling and whatnot, but it's like, that's such a cool moment that I'm sure you're forever gonna like have regardless of the outcome or whatever had happened. So that's that's awesome yeah i mean i think i think that's what it's about right is these are the people that help you get to that point without them you would have had no shots so mm -hmm. it's important to include them it feels better to include them you know knowing that you accomplish this together as a team i mean 
Otherwise, if it's just you, the feeling isn't as sweet, right? Like yeah, uh, for you, sure. you want your people to be along for the ride and you want to simultaneously be there for theirs when they, when they have their come ups, you know, and that's, probably what it's like to be a parent i'm, I'm yet yeah. to conquer that <laughs> yeah no exactly that. yeah that's man so that, true. that's cool your buddies your your teammates they all feel a win when you feel a win that's what it's about for sure all right now the transition i want to jump into something <laughs> to mojo. that uh this man was extremely successful as mojo as the character mojo which crazy uh, mojo the first time i met mojo i saw mojo in the ring i was like yo does this dude just oh my God. have coffee in his freaking <laughs> IV or like, what is it? Just the C4? The energy that like, you have. I was like yeah. in shock, man, the way this man and his character and his energy, but he was so great at what he did that he just grabbed the people. But yeah. I mean, you were seven time WWE 24 seven champion, right? That's unbelievable. You were Andre the Giant Memorial Batter Royal Battle winner, which <laughs> tongue twister. Oh, a bit of a tongue twister. But I actually remember I remember watching yeah, you, you win that, that, man. And for me, I'll be honest, before you talk about it, man, you kind of motivated me because you were a former NFL guy who won that, right? And I think Baron Corbin, was Baron Corbin won it first or you won it first? He, he won it the year before, I think. Okay, yeah. and then you won the year after, right? Yeah. So oh, you know, true, you motivated yeah. me as playing my character because I was like, ah, oh, man, it's two ex NFL guys who grew into this industry, who become very successful. So um, thank you for that motivation. But I want now to dive into this because, bro, you've been extremely successful. You've done so much in WWE. Talk about this character. Obviously, you said this was your first love. But talk about this roller coaster right now. I want to hear a lot about this, man. I'm, I'm curious now. Yeah, man. Well, uh, shoot, coming in was was kind of crazy, right? So uh, I had an injury in, in, in football with the Cardinals. Um, my calf tore off and rolled up in the Ooh. back of my knee. I had like this four and a half inch retraction Ooh. gap. You could literally put your fist into the spot where my calf used to be. It was horrific. Oh my wow. gosh. And I was out for 18 months and I thought I was done. I actually had already like moved on in my mind. I signed a contract to go work over at Merrill Lynch. Um, I was like fortunate enough to be, be able to walk again after that, let alone, you know, try and re uh, return to the field of play. But you know, rehab, I was all on and I went back to the University of Maryland and was rehabbing with uh, the team there and, you know, was able to kind of come back from this thing a little bit. And um, I was looking at, you know, going back to football and I knew even then and, you know, Savvy, as you know, like I was talking with the Raiders and the Jets and I thought I would get a shot with one of those two teams. And even if I had, I could have been cut the next week, you know, and I was well aware of that. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do there, but I had this opportunity to check out what was going on with WWE because the Gronkowski brothers, they were always, you know, some of my best friends and their dad was college roommates with Mike Rotunda, who just actually got announced yes. to enter the Hall of Fame. Mm. Um, but they made a phone call. We talked to Mike. He set up um, a little interview tryout kind of thing. And, and that was it, man. I, I got the offer and, uh, you know, I left football to, to come to wrestling. I mean, obviously spent my entire career trying to to make it in football and I finally got to that level and I would have been compensated as much as such I would have been making somewhere in the neighborhood of like 400 to 500 a year with football if I would have stayed and made the team of course which those those are all big ifs yeah you know? nothing's but, guaranteed uh, yep but you had the opportunity I had the opportunity to come to WWE, make $39,000 a year and start <laughs> over from scratch in an industry I had only watched on TV and had done nothing in firsthand, but, you know, sat down, really evaluated things and, and, and long-term um, aspirations. And I was like, you know what? I, I want to do this. I think this is going to be cool. I think this is something I could be good at. It's the first thing I ever wanted to do. And, and I came on over and I like started and we were, this was before the performance center. We were at that piece of crap facility yeah. in, in Tampa. Tampa. Which, yeah. But everyone thought it was awesome at the time. Yeah. I'm thinking about <laughs> the Packers facility. I was like, yeah. what the hell is this thing? <laughs> this is where WWE starts. You're like, wait, water. what? <laughs> They're like, you have to bring water. We don't have water here. There's no water. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my. That's called, hey, that's called humbling, my brother. Right. Humbling right there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're 
wrestling at armories. There's oh, like yeah. tanks outside. I was like, these are not the arenas <laughs> that I see before. on TV. Yeah, what the heck is this? Oh, I remember yeah. uh, we can all relate to that. Bliss signed a month after I did, and um, Alexa's first show. Uh, she texted me and she's like, "Hey, I think I'm lost." You know, because we we became buddies like from the start. Yeah. She's like, I, I think I'm at the wrong place. There's a tank outside, and this building looks like it fits a hundred people. I was like, no, you're nope. on the right. Side. That's, it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best because people don't obviously when even you know when we first started in NXT the performance center even and like people don't realize you know the grind and what you do in the beginning and it's like anything you have to build your you know you have to make your. Uh, work your way up but um we joke around with some of the places that we've like wrestled at and even like in nxt in the beginning and i was just always like wow this is like what what where you start like this There's... is kind of crazy but we, we we talked mojo we talked on one of our past podcasts about this so through my transition i remember uh you know i was playing tampa eighty thousand people again escorted to my car beautiful locker rooms i remember the first armory i had our live show on there was a cockroach Cockroach. In the, in, yeah. uh, there was no, no, literally, bro. There was a cockroach right next to my chair when I was getting dressed, and I actually remember like pausing, like just it, like life stopped for a second, and I was like, I went from playing in front of eighty thousand to getting dressed next to a cockroach for like fifty <laughs> people, and like it's humbling, bro. But like I understand we got to start somewhere, and that was a, and I obviously you talk about it too a little bit, but that was a big transition for me, man. I was, it was really tough for me. Um, to really, I was really grateful for the opportunity, but it was really, really hard because you go from a pinnacle up at top to like the bottom of something where you're not good, you suck, you have to start all over. Um, obviously your financial uh, compensation <laughs> is like a fraction. So it's a lot of these factors that people don't see and I'm glad you're saying it because they see Mojo run out in, in uh, you know, WrestleMania. They see Mojo on TV on Monday Night Raw or SmackDown. Like, wow, he's so lucky. But they don't realize the grind you put in, man. They don't realize the sacrifice you put in, the the commitment, the humbling of, wow, this is where I'm at the start from now. So again, kudos, man. I, I love to hear that story. Dude, actually, for for you, it's it's kind of a funny story too because I remember when you came in because you know you were talking with Bardia and Bardia was my agent when I played football yep. and he Bardia called me up and he's like, hey, we got this guy, you know, Savvy's gonna gonna come in and he he told me about you and I remember having this conversation with Baron Corbin and uh, you know anyone else that came from football and uh, it, we were wondering how it was gonna go for you because for us. <laughs> Like we were, we were in the NFL, but like we had very short careers. We were undrafted guys. We knew yeah. we barely got in, but here was a guy that was a second round pick that started games that, that played and had a lengthy career. Yeah, I know. And we're like, all right, we, we came in from here, but we were all, we only got a taste of here. Like this dude lived and operated at yeah. this level, you know, like he, <laughs> made money there yeah. like, we were all broke when we came in. We, were like, we were like this dude made money he's played in stadiums he started games and he was drafted this is gonna be a shock for this dude way more than and now he's gonna be now he's us. gonna be performing at Gainesville <laughs> <laughs> Mojo, 30 people one. bro I would have really or cleaning I, I'm now rings. disappointed you didn't pull me aside with Baron and sat me in a freaking <laughs> corner okay and tell me this is what I'm up against right now <laughs> you could look you, back you, but that was the thing because we were wondering and, and you know we didn't really know you at the time but like you you came in correct you you handled it the right way and you know yeah. with new guys we we would you know, just like people did for me, you try to point out a couple of things because as football players, we were already at a culturally a disadvantage, you know? So yeah, like of course. The, the thing I always like to say is in wrestling, you're supposed to come in and shake everybody's hand. Like mm -hmm. you are the biggest piece of crap on the planet if you don't go around yeah. and shake everybody's hand every mm -hmm. single day, even though we spend 42 hours a day with each other eight days yeah. a week, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. But in football, you know, if you're playing on an NFL team and you go walk up to the superstar player and introduce himself and shake his hand and try to, like, have a conversation, as good as that is in wrestling, it's equally that bad in football. Yep. You haven't earned the right to approach that guy. Good point. Wow, yeah. Yep. That you know, is so very like, interesting. You, you walk into a locker room and you see Randy Orton sitting there. 
you know, you probably want to try to in, in the football not, mindset. Not say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, not say anything to him. That yeah, was yeah. such a big thing. Because I haven't earned the right to speak words to him, and that's that'll get you in trouble. But these are the things, like, you know, in wrestling, people take offense to, and I understand it's, it's the culture and it's the way to do it. But that's why it's important to have, like, buddies try to at least give you the heads up so you know how to... Uh, you know, protect yourself because you, you would think you were doing the right thing and, and you're just not. You just don't know it. For sure. And I think you guys off the bat, had, well, say I kind of did too, but you kind of already had that rep of like, oh, football guy coming in, didn't yeah. really love the business. Well, I that, mean, we all know about that, but clearly a, you did, that, obviously. That's exactly <laughs> what I was about to touch on. I think it's yeah. even more impressive that you and, you know, and Baron Corbin, both you guys had tremendous, Baron's still going, but you guys both had tremendous careers in the WWE. And, to me, that's even more impressive because, listen, man, I, I might get some grief for this, but I don't really care. You know, that wrestling community was don't like you guys, don't like us. They don't like people coming from a different industry that didn't grow up and love the business. And I think, you know, not to turn about on, on Tino, about my character, I think that's one of the biggest thing that Tino kept fighting was people kept questioning, why is Tino here? Why is Tino here? Is he love the business? Is he going to buy in? I mean, he has money. He's not broke. Why is he here? And I got so sick of like kind of having that stigma around me. Like, bro, like I'm here. I'm here. I'm committed. I'm fully I'm committed. The work I've in. humbled yeah. myself. Why you guys keep questioning me? And I think, you know, I admire that you and Baron has just took off on the rocket and said F you to that because you guys both kind of did it. Tino never really got the opportunity from injuries and some stuff, but um, you know, kudos to that because I do feel like again, just like when you walked on in college, you were kind of like the underdog, you beat it, you won. Pros, you were underdog, you beat it, you won. Coming to WWE, I don't know, man. This guy was a football player. Is he a diehard? You beat it and you won again. So for me, that's, dude, tip my hat, bro. That's unbelievable, man. Really, it is. Because I, I saw that energy. I had to put up with it, too. So, yeah. you know, good kudos, brother. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I to, a, to a point, I get it. It's like, all right, we're hardcore wrestling fans. We want guys that came in and paid their dues and yeah. did it the right I way. I do. I get it, too. That Yeah, it started in the flea markets, you know, not some guy that was just given a job that might not want it, you know, that yep. came from football or, you know, wherever and was a star somewhere else and was just gift wrapped this opportunity. And then now this guy's being pushed. He's, you know, they're using all of our wrestling favorites from the Indies to put him over and build mm -hmm. this guy up. This dude hasn't earned it. You know, like I, I totally understand For that sure. mindset, you know, but after a while, yeah, it starts to wear thin, you know, you're, you're, you're there every day. You're working harder than those those guys that that they want to see be successful. And of course, the fans can't see who's clocking in first and clocking out last and everything that you're trying to do while you're there, because, you know, that was one thing that gave us the leg up as we were we were used to that grind, you know, so coming in and and doing weights and competing in there and trying to be the best, like and putting in those extra hours. A lot of these guys, you know, maybe they wrestled an indie match and then they went home and they they don't lift weights and they don't do extra conditioning and they've never done a day of film study in their life and you know all of these things and meanwhile we're we're doing all this stuff it, after a while it gets frustrating you know but um yeah you know you just got to keep that in mind and, and and stay with it eventually they'll all you know find uh, a way to get back to you if you stay committed and, and hungry long enough i mean I know for me, that was really tough for me to overcome in, in the beginning because I was working against all those things. Of course, I came in as the football player, but for me, with with my energy, it was easily marketable by WWE. You know, yeah. this is our this is our hype guy. We can run with this. We don't need him to main event any shows. Let's let this guy be the opener. You know, let him come out, get the crowd all fired up, basic match, simple. Get in, get out, get gone, and, and get everyone else hyped up like that. That was that was my role. So I debuted very early because of that. Um, and they were having me run through everybody. And I was super grateful for that. But that didn't necessarily do me any favors um, with the hardcore smart marks. You know, here's a football mm -hmm. player that's just steamrolling everybody. So like that, that first few years in NXT was, man, that was tough to get past that later on. Like that's all anybody wanted to remember. I mean, I debuted before I really knew more than a few moves in the ring too, you know? So it was yeah. like very basic. And meanwhile, we're competing with all these guys that have been doing this for 10, 20 years, you know, like this has been their life. So it's, it's, it's really hard coming in and, you know, every year it probably gets a little bit more difficult 
on those guys, especially now where NXT is. I mean, I, I guess they've kind of evened it out a little bit recently, but for a while it was like NXT, which was supposed to be the developmental yeah. brand, was all guys like Finn Balor and yeah. Adam. Yeah, Cole. I know. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, what? I'm supposed to compete with compete that? With that? Yeah, exactly. Who's been wrestling for how many years? Uh, this is supposed <laughs> to be developmental. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, developmental, my ass. Yeah. Those guys could be headlining WrestleMania no, tomorrow. I know. Crazy. <laughs> But that you know, you know, you make a great point though, Mojo. But also, and I do agree with you on that point where you know you come in and you understand. I do understand they're protecting the business. I get that, and I admire it. And I shake everybody's hand on that. But at the end of the day, you have to realize that you got the opportunity. Baron Corbin got the opportunity because you guys were successful before you got there, right? You put the work in that was equivalent to the same work that they put in in yeah. the indies, but you were playing football. So that's that's what I kind of like got a little bit little mad about was like, yo, you think I was just on the street like a bum and they came to get me and get me? No, like you got your opportunity because you were so successful. So that means while they were putting their work in, in the indies, right? You were putting your work in, in college football. You were putting your work in, in the NFL. And that's was like the thing that I got a little upset about was like, yo, like no disrespect, like, we got this opportunity because we were so damn successful at our other industry. So that was where I kind of got a little bit angry in a sense of like, I understand they're protecting the business, but there's Mojo's not here for a mistake. Baron Corbin's not here by mistake. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, everyone, everyone had different paths. And that was something I always touched on too because I, I got that a lot. Even Mandy. And it was just like, you know, we all worked um, super hard to get to where we are regardless of you know what it was so I just feel like and I agree with what you're saying as well um, with how it works but I think also once you put in the work and the time and you realize that you are here for you know you you want to become successful you want to be um, be better you know every day and, and improve then it's like you should really gain that respect because I, I could see in the beginning people looking at me like oh bikini competitor like she just wants to be famous I got that so much or reality show that I came from that was the same thing it was like she's just a reality you know star or whatever um so I think though after when you put in the work and I felt like I struggled with that a lot too I think it took me a while to realize that like like I felt like I always had to like prove myself in a way which I feel like that gets tiring after a while and I think eventually um you know it paid off for me but in the end but it's just it's part of the business I guess it is you know part of the business. It's, it's part of well, I, I listen I admire both you guys because you both had tremendous WWE careers um you know, especially uh, both, you know, Mandy at the end of your career, double champion, probably one of the biggest NXT stars ever had for women. So both of you guys, you guys overcame that stigmatism. You overcame that reputation. And you guys both uh, conquered what you wanted to conquer. So that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it just makes for a better show too, right? You can't have everybody on the show doing the same thing. I mean, yep. uh, you need that balance. People coming in from different walks of life, bringing something unique to the table, um, you know, I feel like if it was all independent wrestlers and it's only career wrestlers that that make it, that's not nearly as exciting. Everyone's going to start working the same. You know, they're going to bring that indie mindset to, you know, mainstream television. And that just it just doesn't translate to everybody, you yep. know, so you sure. want to see. You know, okay, here's a second round pick in the NFL, a guy that's broken all kinds of strength and speed records, a physical specimen uh, that looks the way you look too. You want to see how that guy's going to stack up against the guy that's been wrestling since he was four and is a third generation superstar. And then, you know, you factor in all these other walks of life. So, I mean, that's that's what makes it fun, right? When we were watching as kids, if you want to take absolutely. Back to to the yeah. attitude era or, or Hulk and warrior and all these people. I mean, that those matchups were what was fun and exciting. And, you know, I think it's important for people to remember that there's a spot for everybody on the card. You, you need That's a great everybody. Point. You can't have everybody point. work in the same way or else it's, it's not cool. You know, like we get so sucked into thinking what the hardcore fans are going to think of. We often neglect what the casual fans are going yeah. to think of, you know, like the, the the mom and the dad that are bringing their, their four young kids and the people that are tuning back in that haven't watched in five to 10 to 20 years. Like they are going to look for completely different things uh, than the people that watch every episode of wrestling every single week. And now it's pretty much on every single night. There's just so much content. Mm -hmm. um, you just got to keep all those people in mind and, 
you know, people forget that this is a business at the end of the day and you know, yep. you got to You got to treat it as such. And you know, that, that goes under the radar a lot of times. Exactly. So speaking of business, um, I want to talk a little bit about your transition after WWE. Cause, um, like Savvy and I were, were talking about it. You know, I, I really commend the fact that you did something really special after WWE with all the networking and all the people that you know and and you know created a talent agency with Steve uh, Paragon Talent Agency and I think it's really impressive and very smart in a way because you have all these connections and you know the last few years there's been a lot of releases of you know WWE and all of you know a lot of our friends release come back all that so I just feel like it was a very um very smart decision so what made you guys do that you know was this always something you wanted to do so talk a little bit about uh Paragon and your transition after WWE yeah absolutely man well you know they they say you always got to have that um that backup plan in your back pocket mm -hmm. right and Things were going great with WWE. I was actually headed in to do some things that I was really excited about on TV, and then COVID hit, and uh, I got it really bad, like really bad. I almost died from it. I had to go to the hospital. Um, I couldn't breathe. Like I, I got hit, and for some reason, it hit me worse than I think anybody else in the company. I couldn't wear T-shirts. I couldn't lay down. Like anything oh was gosh. suffocating. There were days where I couldn't speak. Um, yeah, I, wow. I got hit Whoa. that bad. So I was on the shelf for almost an entire year and it wasn't really getting better. It would get better in, in, in spurts and then it would go right back to, to being awful. I can't talk again. And uh, there was no rhyme or reason for it. it. It was up, it was down, it was all over the place. And I was really concerned that, you know, maybe we'd be building towards a pay-per-view match and then one of these bouts would hit and I couldn't function. I mean... There's no way I would have been able to go out there. Plus, every time you get body slammed, that's on your back, on your lungs. So yeah. <clears throat> that could have resulted in a death from the most basic move. So wow. um, had a conversation with WWE, and you know that was it. We we went our own separate ways, um, and I needed to figure out what to do next. And luckily, that that football background, that that business background that I had, because I always studied business in school, and you know I interned for Morgan Stanley for a long time. I always had this idea of starting a, a talent management company for wrestlers. You know, obviously this is a place where there's no union, there's no representation. Very, mm. very, very few people have agents or managers of any kind. It's a business where you kind of just got to take where you're given and there's no pushback because the show's scripted. If you don't accept it, they'll, they'll sign somebody else who will. And you really kind of get down on your your self-worth it's uh it's, it's very hard to stand up for yourself um so i you know i i was a free agent and i always had this idea somebody needs somebody needs to do this there there is a market for it the wrestlers are so capable more than athletes in any other sport that i've ever seen it, it would be it would be a killing for whoever started this thing and for the talent as well and you know, I knew I wanted to start this thing, but, uh, you know, starting this by yourself, one person, I mean, that's a heavy haul. I mean, definitely wanted to do it regardless and was going to, but I, I knew I needed some help and I needed somebody that I could trust. So um, I got out, I called Steve K, who was one of my one of my best friends. He's um, He was actually the talent booker over at the Hard Rocks anytime we would yeah. have shows in Vegas. Steve was the guy that hooked up everybody's hotels and comped us at the clubs and all this and that. And I, I knew Steve was a huge mark as well. So <laughs> I called Steve and I pitched him this idea and I was like, bro, you should start this thing with me. You know, like, I think this could be great. And I mean, that conversation took like 10 seconds. He, yeah. he was in and like right away he was in. So we started this company together and, you know, we, we thought we were going to start small, maybe grab like 10 clients and, and really focus on them and, and, and see what we could figure out. And the company just blew up overnight. Obviously there was no other representation. Everyone started calling us when the word got out. And now uh, I think we're gonna hit three years as a company next month, but we've done paid deals for over 300 talent. Um, we're working with a dozen pro sports leagues. Um, we're doing social media deals and third party deals and all that, but we're also doing long-term contract negotiations with all the bigs. Um, 
you know, autograph signings, visas for the international talent. I mean, this thing just grew to whatever it needed to be from the talent calling and asking for help and, you know, kind of learning some things along the way, but being able to apply our backgrounds. Uh, it's been great, man. We've had, uh, I don't know exactly how many, but maybe around 15 talent where we made them more money than they made in their best year in WWE in, in their first year out. Um, so I always yeah. thought that was really cool. Wow. A little that's badge awesome. of honor. But it's like, it's it's crazy now. Like the opportunity that's there, like the market loves wrestling and they have yeah. no idea, you know, because a lot of these brands, like these, these executives, they don't watch anymore. Maybe they watched in the Attitude Era, but, you know, like... A lot of average people walk in the street. They they don't know what they're missing right now. So it's been our job to kind of reintroduce the world of professional wrestling to them in the filter of a uh, you know a, a corporate boardroom. And it it's really taken off, man. It's been a really wow. really awesome business and probably something at least in a wrestling sense that I've been most proud of and probably my biggest contribution to the business. That's awesome. And I think the two of you, because I obviously have worked with you guys and, you know, they got me my autograph uh, signing, which has been, uh, you know, my exclusive uh, autograph with big events. So that's been awesome. But I think it's really great. The two of you, um, it's a really good dynamic. I think obviously for the purposes of Steve and his background and what he knows and then having you being from the wrestling world. Right. So you obviously can kind of feel what we feel in a way because you've been there and you're you're part of us as well so i think it's a really good um dynamic that you guys have so congratulations with all your guys' success it's awesome you know what i yeah, oh go ahead it's, it's been it's been kind of funny because steve i mean obviously steve's never wrestled a day in his life but <laughs> steve handles all of you know most of our wrestling stuff you know so like yeah. the independent bookings and the autograph signings that's all steve as the non-wrestler and me as the wrestler I, I don't do any of that. I do all of our third party brand stuff. So everything outside of wrestling, which uh, so we kind of flipped on that one, but we realized that with our, our tools, we were better equipped for what we're doing. I mean, for long-term contract negotiations with WWE and AEW, we both come together and, and work on those. Those are obviously some of the biggest things we do. So we got all hands on deck for that one. But yeah, I always thought that was kind of funny that we we pulled the old switcheroo on that. <laughs> yeah, that that is actually really funny. I didn't even know that really. I thought you guys, I mean, you guys obviously handle both of it and um you helped me a little bit with my contract that I sent over recently, which was helpful. Yeah. Um, but go on, sorry. But, uh, you know what I was just gonna say was, um, Mojo, that's, you know the tremendous about that is, you know, all athletes, I gone through it, we all go through it, you know, all we know is what we've done our whole life, right? So it's a scary moment when all us athletes go, oh, what are we gonna do next in life? Even if you have money, you still gotta do something, right? If you, right. So yeah. for me, I think you've done a tremendous job of utilizing everything you've accomplished, all the success you've had, and you catapult that into your next career. Because like you said, you're, you're a very personable guy, you're very successful, you have a great personality, um, you know a lot of people, um, you've been in the WWE industry, and for you to say, like you said, like, there's no union in WWE. Like NFL, we come from a union, we have representation, we have agents, so for you to use everything you've done and catapult now to the, you know, probably maybe the rest of your life, um, that's huge, man, and congratulations, because a lot of people, a lot of athletes struggle with that aspect. I went through it. You know, I, we all go mm -hmm. through it. So for me, you know, I admire that, man. It's, uh, it's good that you're, you know, not only you created something special that helps other people, but, you know, financially it's going to help you and your family as well, man. It's awesome. Yeah, man, it's, um, you know, it all, it all kind of came together, and you always want to find next steps that you're passionate about, and it's, it's easier said than done because you know how it is with sports. It never – ends when you expect never, it to never Very mm -hmm. few people retire Dude. on their own after their hall of fame career we just talked about that it, so true it's even different with wrestling because in football you reach a point even if you're tom brady you, you gotta retire at some point yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but with wrestling you don't essentially ever have to retire, you know? So um, you can be a manager. You can be doing this in your 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, even yeah, producer. After yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like 
you know, if if your time comes to an end, it, the odds of it being against your will are even even greater. And it's it's terrifying when you're out, man. And you know, yeah, especially. To, sorry, go on. Oh no, I was just gonna say, especially too, because you know, at least when you when you have it end with with sports, you're probably younger, where you you can do next careers, and it's not a deterrent to employers. But like with wrestling, if you get out and you're 30, 40, 50, and you know, you need to find ways to make ends meet, ends meet, like starting over in another career at that age is, is even scarier. It's even more brutal. So it's a, yeah. uh, it's a tough road out there. So having it buddies is. that, that can help this network on the outside. I mean, it, it, it makes a difference and we're, we're happy to be able to help with that. Definitely. It gives hope for, you know, other people, like you said, because it is a very, it's a fear, you know, when, when that day will come or when that, you know, Savvy would always tell me to, when I was in the height of my career too, he's like, you know, he's like that call eventually at one point it's still going to come. So it's just always one of those things. But, um, I want to talk about, um, how you met Megan the stallion <laughs> recently. Um, how was that in, uh, Tokyo? Yes, we went out there for the Crunchyroll Anime Awards. So um, cool. Uh, Mercedes yeah. uh, Monet, Sasha Banks, she is a massive anime fan. So we were trying to find uh, something for her in that world. And, you know, C Crunchyroll is essentially the the Netflix of anime, right? That they yeah. just they are the the end all in the anime world. And, you know, I've watched my share of animes and as a kid, you know, <laughs> Dragon Ball Z and, and, and shows like that. But uh, I had no idea the the world out there, um, the, the, the scope of the anime community. It's unbelievable. But uh, we got Mercedes on. She's going to be doing some exciting work with Crunchyroll. One of the things was to go to their anime awards and uh, be a presenter alongside Demarcus Lawrence from the Cowboys, which was really cool. Really, That's really nice. Cool. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, Megan the Stallion was there. <laughs> She's sitting at the table next to us. So and, cool. Um, I didn't realize, but I guess she was going to do something with Mercedes at um, a SummerSlam <laughs> at WWE in, in years previous, and it just yeah. never materialized. It, it, it fell through for one reason or another. Obviously, we all know how, the, how those situations can right. go. They get crazy, but... Man, she was cool, man. She first of all, she is tall. I didn't realize really how, how tall she was. Yeah, I want to say she's like six feet tall or something like oh, that. Oh, wow. I would not think that either. Yeah, that that was the first thing she said because she stood wow. up um, and she was like, "Yeah, y'all didn't realize how tall your girl was." And I was Damn. like, "Damn, oh, definitely <laughs> did." <laughs> and she had these big heels on too. So wow. Yeah, I mean, I felt like she was a foot taller than Steve, which was pretty funny for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the picture that I one. saw, yeah. Well, speaking of Mercedes, didn't she just have a nice yeah. uh, debut? Well, let's, let's talk about that, talk a, little about that a little bit. Talk about that a little bit. you're close with Mercedes, um, and I think it's been, you know, in the works for a little while and whatnot, but um, pretty exciting. AEW, big business. She had her big debut. That's pretty she, cool. Man, she is another example of everything that we're talking about right now, right? Betting on yourself and, and mm -hmm. finding a new life. I mean, she was with WWE. They had no plans of firing her. I mean, and then she no. she stood up for herself, her and Trinity, and they handed back the tag titles and decided to double down on themselves and, and go another way. And I mean, how often do you see somebody do that? I mean, that's, no. I mean, it's happened before, but extremely, extremely rare when you're giving up a huge salary to to bet on yourself and you know i was always really really proud of her for doing that i thought that was a very very underrated thing and i mean i think the three of us on on this call right now probably can understand it better than most people that that came from things after were able to find other stuff you know sorry that people that came from different lives before and were able to find other things after so we definitely know the full side of the spectrum here but Man, the risk that she took was yeah. unbelievable. And then she went over to Japan 
and did her thing. She was training her ass off all over the world in every single style. She's flying, she's flying to Mexico, she's flying to Japan, she's flying to England, and she's learning from all of these, these top pros all over the world to hone her game. I mean, I always thought that was so badass. And then sure. she goes out to Japan and has that nasty, nasty injury. You put oh, her on yeah. the shelf for almost an entire year. Um, and then to see it just come full circle last night in Boston, where she's from, so cool. uh, the crowd reception. I mean, man, just being along for the ride this entire time. She's obviously someone we've done a ton of work for, um, you know, the past few years. It's been it's been really cool to see, man. I know she's going to kill it out there and uh, it, it's going to be a really good situation for her and wrestling as a whole. Definitely agree. I think she's really going to bring something special to that, uh, to AEW and, and the women's division as a whole. I mean, someone like Sasha uh, Mercedes, um, you know, she's a trailblazer. And I think, um, I think what she did was very admiring. And like you said, very, you know, it's scary. Like, like you said, you, you have, a, she's, she was one of the top women in the women's division and she wasn't really happy with what was going on. And she, she bet it on herself and, and did what she had to do. And at the end of the day, I mean, she's she's happy. That's what matters, right? She's 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 a, a wonderful um, entertainer and, and wrestler. And I think now to see her happy and where she she wants to be and whatever the circumstances may be, um, I think it's awesome. And I think she's really going to bring something really interesting over there, which is really cool. I think uh, and also anybody listening to this podcast, I think it's a prime example of don't be afraid to bet on yourself, man. Mm -hmm. If you sacrifice and you develop that work ethic and you um, commit to you and what you wanna do, never be scared to bet on yourself. Just make sure that you have the mindset to do that. Um, yeah. So I admire that, man, because you know what? Especially in that world, uh, you gotta stick up for yourself at some points. Um, so sometimes um, she knew she knew her work ethic. She knew her passion. She knew that all that was going to come through at the end of the day. And uh, kudos to her. And I wish her nothing but the best. And it's um, it's exciting to, to watch how much she's done in her wrestling career. Um, and obviously, it's not over. So, but Mojo, as this comes to an end, uh, we can't thank you enough. But before you leave, you need to give anybody listening to this podcast some advice um, because I'm impressed on everything you've accomplished, your work ethic. I want you to end this conversation, this podcast about just, it could be short, sweet, whatever, but I want some people that are listening to this, I want you to give them some advice on life um, going forward. Well, if I got two words for everybody, it's not <laughs> <laughs> if I got two words for everybody, it's stay hyped, man. I mean, look, I know that was my, my tagline or whatever in WWE. But for me, that was always my mindset, right? Stay hyped. You got to be always on no breaks, no time off. Uh, you got to be all in on what you want to do. And, you know, stay hyped isn't just like being excited. It's just being always motivated and, uh, and always hungry and always working towards your goals and your dreams. And, and that's what it's about, man. You can overcome a lot of shortcomings and as far as as talent or opportunity with work ethic and passion. You know, you might not be there now, but you certainly will be if you never give up and and you stay with it and you stay humble and you stay hungry and and you stay on that grind. So that that would be the advice I would give everybody. Find something you're passionate about, find something that that you love, that you really want, and just apply yourself. Put your full self behind it. Don't ever make excuses for yourself as to why you can't get there or why someone else is getting that opportunity. You find a way to ad adapt and overcome, and, and that's what it's about, man. Stay hyped. I love <laughs> it. I love it. it, man. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mojo. We appreciate it. And for those of you listening, um, please continue to like and subscribe on Power Alphas Podcasts on YouTube. We're also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and we'll be on a new platform coming very soon, hopefully, like, the next couple episodes will be on there. Um, a little process, but we'll be on there, which we're excited about. So thank you all for listening, and thank you, Mojo, Mojo for joining. Thanks, man.